So welcome everybody to the Universal Civil Computing Center. This is a series of seminars that we are organizing in the context of the project Quantum Spain, which is a project that we are coordinating and uh, it involves all the Spanish supercomputing network and, and surely uh, other institutions across Spain. And the main idea of this project is to create ecosystem around this, this technology and around the quantum computer that we will host here at, at BSC. And today we have the pleasure to, to welcome Carmina Garcia Almudeve. She's a professor at the Technical University of Valencia. And before that, she was a, um, she was a student here at UPC. And, I did my PhD here. I did your PhD here. And I think she's an, a good example of how this, uh, this, uh, this field uh, is evolving towards having more and more people from different backgrounds, and especially from engineering. And I think she will talk about this a little bit more during the, uh, her talk. And after uh, her, P her PhD, she moved to, uh, to University of Delft, to QTech uh, group, which is one of the most important groups in Europe working in quantum computing. And after that, she, she um, recently moved to Valencia uh, as a distinguished research researcher with uh, Beatriz Galindo. Mm -hmm. And we hope that she stays in uh, Spain uh, for a long time. And probably we'll see. Permanently. The accreditation will say, right? <laughs> <laughs> so welcome, uh, Carmen, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ola. Thank you for the kind introduction. And thank you for having invited me to the Cathedral of Supercomputing. So it's a great pleasure to be here today at Barcelona Supercomputer Center, a leader in supercomputers here, in supercomputing here in Spain, and also one of the, the main centers in Europe and across the world. So Salva said, so I'm an engineer, I'm not a physicist. I started working on quantum computing like in 2014 when I moved uh, to TUDELF. And today I will be talking about full stack quantum computing systems. More precisely, what that means is that those are the different layers that connect quantum algorithms with quantum devices. And we will not only talk about these different layers, but we will, I will also talk about how to architect them, what's crucial nowadays, and, and what are the main challenges that we are facing and what, how the, the future looks like. I would like to start uh, this talk with a brief introduction to, to the main concepts of quantum computing for those in the audience who might not be familiar with this with this field. And I know that some of you already know about quantum computing, even if you are experts, right? So feel free to take an app now and then reconnect in five, in five to 10 minutes. So maybe the first time that you heard about quantum computers, you ask yourself, why to build a quantum computer? Why quantum computers, right? So as you may know, quantum computers will be able to solve some problems, very complex problems that are intractable, even for the most powerful supercomputers that we have nowadays. Examples of those problems are the ones related to simulation, the ones related to search or to optimization. Just to be more precise, by simulating chemical reactions and molecules, we will be able to develop, for instance, a, a stronger polymers for airplanes or more efficient materials for solar cells, or even to synthesize new drugs. Of course, they will have impact in different, uh, in different areas, in different industries, such as aerospace, automotive, pharma, energy, chemistry, and so on. Another example uh, in which quantum computers will be, or, or quantum computers will be good at is at optimization problems. So there are already, with the, the current computers that we have nowadays, we are able to solve some instances or small instances of these problems by using hybrid approach in which classical solvers are combined with quantum solvers. By, using, by solving these optimization problems, we will be able to develop better products and services, and again, we'll have impact in, in, in different industries, such as logistics, healthcare, or finance. And then finally, one of the most popular examples, but for me, not the most uh, representative uh, one, at least uh, nowadays, is the application of quantum computers in the field of security, in the decryption of data, right? It is said that at some point, if we build a large scale and fault around quantum computer, we will be able to break one of the most widely, uh, widely used systems in security that is called RSA and is based in the factorization of very large numbers by using the so-called so, uh, share algorithm. But again, this is the most popular example, right? That's the first thing that I think you heard when anyone talks about quantum computing, but we are still far, far away from that. So what is quantum computing all about? What is different in quantum computing? As you know, the basic unit of information in classical computers is the bit. A bit is an exclusive state, meaning that it can be either zero or one at any point in time. In quantum computing, the basic unit of information is called quantum bit or just qubit. The extraordinary thing about qubits is that they can be in state zero 
or one, but they can be also in both states in zero at one at the same time. And this is what we call superposition. This superposition state is represented by this, I don't know the point is working, yeah, by this linear combination of alpha zero zero plus alpha one one, in which these alpha parameters can be complex numbers and they represent somehow how much my quantum state is in zero and how much my quantum state is in one, okay? What happens when we want to read out the superposition of quantum state? What happens, we do the, that through a process that is called measurement. We measure the qubits, we measure the quantum state, and the point is we cannot read out this superposition. We cannot get, at least in a single shot measurement, we cannot get the value of these alpha parameters. What you get, it's a binary result, a binary outcome being zero or one, and the probability of getting a zero or one is given, sorry, is given by these alpha parameters. So to be more precise, uh, the probability of getting a, a, zero, a, a zero or binary result zero is given by the model of, of alpha zero square, whereas the probability of getting a one is given by the modulus of alpha one square. And of course, because they are probabilities, the addition should be equal to one. And on top of that, when I measure the qubits, I collapse my quantum state, I collapse the superposition to the uh, binary, to the, to the state, sorry, that I read out. For instance, if I get a zero, my state is collapsed to state zero. If I get a one, my, my state is collapsed to one. That means that I destroy the superposition and therefore I lose the information that was stored there. Yeah, again, Important thing, measurement is a probabilistic process. And therefore, as I will emphasize later, quantum computing is not deterministic, it's also probabilistic, yeah? Say that, what else? We have qubits, which is the basic unit of information, and we also have quantum gates, very similar to logical gates in, in, quantum, in, in classical computing. And again, this is one of the main, the main let's say, model of computation that we use nowadays. There are others like quantum annealing and the quantum computing that I will, I will not enter into that. So here you can see some examples of what we call single qubit gates, the Pauli X case, and also the Hadamard gate that, that is very important because it puts the qubit in superposition. And also some examples of other gates that act in two gates, like the C node that it enables entanglement, something that I will mention later, or a swap gate that just exchanges the state between two qubits. With these gates and with these qubits, we can build circuits that the one you can see here on the right, in which is composed by four qubits, Q0 to Q3, in which different single qubit gates and two qubit gates are applied to them. And at the end, we usually we always measure them. Yeah. So by the way, you have any questions, so feel free to stop me and ask any question anytime. No, it should it should only be on, not only at the end. So, but where the power of quantum computers come from? So the power comes from when we start putting qubits together. So let's first look at the, at the, let's say, at the classical example. Imagine that you have a system composed by three bits. With three bits, you can represent the state 0, 0, 0, or 0, 0, 1, or 0, 1, 0, up to 1, 1. That means that n bits hold one value that ranges from 0 to 2 to the n minus 1 being n, the number of bits. What happens when I have a system with three qubits? With three qubits, I can, I can define this larger uh, state space which is composed by the state 0, 0, 0, and 0, 0, 1, and 0, 1, 0, up to 1, 1, 1. That means that with three qubits, I can represent all these values. So or n qubits hold the two to the n values. Yeah, so any time that I add a, a qubit to my system, I double the computational uh, capability of, of the computer. And on top of that, when I apply any of these gates that I mentioned before, I manipulate all these alpha parameters or these amplitudes at the same time, meaning that quantum computing gives us masses, massive parallelism for free. I mean, there's no free lines here. There are other things we have to deal with, right? But this is in principle, the capabilities of quantum computing. To illustrate a bit more how quantum computing works, so the algorithms, I would like to start, so as I mentioned before, quantum computing is based on superposition, also on entanglement. Entanglement, it's a kind of superposition in which qubits are kind of correlated with each other. That's like basic a definition for that. And how does it work? So usually some algorithms use, uh, start with an equal superposition of all this state. So these bars here, they represent these alpha, alpha parameters here. So they represent the amplitudes. And the algorithms play actually that is called interference in which some of these amplitudes 
the one that has or the one or the ones that have the correct result are amplified, whether the others are minimized or they even cancel each other. So at the end, what I get, it's a distribution that might look like this one. Again, in which this, the correct result will be the one zero zero. Again, let me emphasize again that quantum computing, it's a probabilistic way of computing and the outcome, it's a binary result, yeah? Therefore, when we run a quantum algorithm, it's not enough to run it once, you have to run it several times to get this kind of distribution and therefore the correct output or the correct answer to your problem. Hmm? Now, what else is different in quantum computing? This is something that I like to, to mention and it's not, it's not a straightforward, let's say, that quantum computing is also a very good example of in-memory computing. What it means, because as I said before, the qubits are the basic units that hold the information. Yeah, so it's like, you can think about them as kind of a storage. And it's by applying the case to them, how you perform the computation. So in other words, memory and processing are in the same unit. You don't have to move, let's say, information like in classical systems from memory to processing unit back and forth. Yeah, you will have to move classic, uh, uh, quantum information for other reasons that I will mention later. But in principle, memory and processing uh, happens in the same the same same place, yeah. So so far, I've been discussing the good things, so how wonderful quantum computing is. But of course, there are also bad news, and the bad news is like quantum hardware is uh, error prone. This means that qubits have a short uh, uh, time life, and they lose the superposition just because of the interaction with the environment. And on top of that, the case that, that I was mentioning before, they present a high error rate in the order of 10 to the minus two, 10 to the minus three. So there is no way, unless we play some, some tricks that I will mention, there is no way to perform a reliable computation with these units. What we can do for that, nowadays we are using what is called error mitigation techniques. So try to reduce, let's say, the errors in the system. But in the future, what we, we, what we are also looking at is quantum error correction techniques. Basically, I will not uh, explain in detail what quantum correction is about, but the basic idea is instead of having a one physical qubit, you have what we call a logical qubit that is composed by several physical qubits. And on top of that, you use some extra help per qubits to, to, um, to detect the errors and to correct for them. And this is a huge overhead. That's why we cannot, I mean, we are not able yet to implement these techniques with the hardware that we have nowadays. So what else? What a quantum computer is and what is not. So as I mentioned at the beginning, quantum, computer, quantum computers are not going to be a replacement of classical supercomputers, right? They'll be good at solving some problems that we are intractable, in, even for the supercomputers, but it's not that they are going to replace them. Hmm? And something that I would like also to emphasize is that although I have been talking about quantum computers, what we are actually building, it's a quantum coprocessor or quantum accelerator. They are combined with supercomputing facilities. That's why also here in BCC, we will have like two quantum computers, right? Combine the supercomputers that we have here. So as you know, so in the, in the last year, the architectures, we have the architectures in which you have the main CPU combi uh, combined, sorry, with different uh, accelerators. So as a FPGA, GPUs, TPUs, and a quantum accelerator. So therefore what we are having here, it's a hybrid model of computation, yeah? And with classical facilities are combined with quantum coprocessors. So say that, the idea of building a quantum computer is not new. This is something that was already proposed by the physicist Richard Feynman in 1981 in a keynote that he, he gave in a conference at MIT in which he asked course to like, can physics be, uh, be simulated by a universal computer? The problem is that how we can simulate quantum mechanics. So in order to do so, we have to build a quantum computer. Since then, the field of quantum computer has, uh, has made a remarkable progress with the development of the first algorithms in the early 90s, like the short algorithm that was mentioning before for, for factoring large numbers, to the development of the first uh, quantum annealing by D-Wave, a Canadian company, to the implementation of the first qubit, to the first sort of qubit implementations in the late 90s, early 2000s. So nowadays, there are different technologies that are being explored for building quantum hardware such as superconducting qubits, MB centers, tap ions, quantum dots, you name it, yeah? What do we have nowadays? Nowadays, we already have quantum processors, like for example, the one from Google, the Sycamore processor with 53 qubits that was used to demonstrate quantum advantage. I don't like to say quantum supremacy. We will rather use quantum advantage, right? That is to show that a quantum computer can solve some problem 
being use, uh, useful or not. It can be not useful that a classical computer cannot simulate or cannot solve, right? Then we have also, of course, IBM with the 127 chip Eagle that was released last year. And this year, just last week, they launched this Osprey. I had to, to check how to pronounce that because I was not sure. Osprey with 433 uh, qubits, yeah? So some of the qubits, as you may know, they are available, uh, I mean, they are accessible uh, through the cloud, like for example, through the IBM Quantum Experience that was launched in 2016, or Quantum Inspire, that those are two uh, computers based on superconducting qubits and also based on silicon spin qubits that are in QTEC in Delft. And I had the privilege to develop some of the system for controlling, uh, for controlling these platforms. So again, where is quantum computing now? Quantum computing is now with the so-called NIST era. NIST is a term that was proposed by John Preskill back in 2018, and it stands for Noisy Intermediate Scale Quantum Era. Intermediate scale refers to the size of the quantum processors that we have nowadays and we will have in the next years that consist of to, to a few of 10 qubits, like the ones that I was mentioning before. And noisy emphasizes these unwanted interactions of the qubits with the environment and also the error rates that we have when we apply, the high error rates that we have when we apply a gate to them. So as Preskill mentioned, and I took this daily from his paper, the noise will play several, se uh, several limitations, several limitations, sorry, of what quantum devices will be able to achieve in the near term, because we are limited again by the number of resources, not so many qubits, and by noise. Again, with this, with this kind of systems, we cannot apply yet uh, quantum error correction schemes. So, but quantum computers are already reality. They already exist. For those who have never seen a quantum computer, it looks like, depending on what technology you use, of course, uh, it looks something like that, right? One of the most important technologies, like the superconducting qubits, they work at very low temperatures. And when I say very low, that's, I'm talking about 20 millikelvins, that is close to absolute zero. So they have to, the quantum processors have to be placed in these kind of fridges in which they have different temperature stages, and they are put in the bottom, they call this place 20 millikelvins. And then this carrier start is covered or it's isolated by several layers of metal. This is like this Matroska, Matroska, so it's called Matroska dolls, right? When you have different dolls for each other. So something similar here, you have different layers of isolation. Yeah. Now here you have some cables that are going there. So out of this fridge, there are cables that go from the very low temperature from the chip to room temperature where the control electronics are placed. So the control electronics, and I'm talking about classical like AWGs, analog waveform simulators, DAX, ADCs, that are used to operate the qubits, are used for operating, for applying this gauge that I was mentioning before, and they are used also for reading out information. Yeah, so, and this is all this stack here, plenty of, 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 of devices there. It can be much bigger than that. So these quantum computers that I was, or this computer was showing before, what they already implement is what we call the full stack. The full stack, as I said, is the different layers that allows to bridge quantum algorithms with quantum device, devices. For those who are a computer architects, this looks, I mean, this, uh, has, this picture is familiar to you. So what they allow is to express a quantum algorithm using a high level programming language, usually Python. Physicists like Python very much, right? So any other language that you can come up with and translate it into, through the compiler to low level language, so Rosalie kind of quantum, quantum, quantum assembly language that, uh, that those are, uh, that belong to the instruction set architecture that are implemented through the macro architecture into a series of signals that operate on the qubits. Again, the gates at the end operations are signals. For example, in the case of superconducting qubits, they are microwave signals with a specific uh, envelope, a specific amplitude and frequency, yeah? So let me walk you through the stack. So at the top of the stack, we have the quantum algorithms. And I like to use this picture very much. So here you can see the speed up that you can get from an algorithm versus the robustness or the tolerance to errors that you need, yeah? So here on the right side, on the, on the bottom right side, you can see that we can get exponential speed up with algorithms like the shores that I was mentioning before, or the HHL algorithm that is for solving linear systems. Yeah, but still we are far, far away from that because for that we will need a computer with maybe millions of qubits that are error corrected. What we are, where we are nowadays, 
and Alba knows very well about this because she's one of the, uh, the one looking at these algorithms, is here in this area in the top left, in which we are looking at the so-called variational quantum algorithms. This variational is to combine, as I say again, classical uh, uh, classical processors together with, with quantum processors to solve this kind of problem. Some, some examples of these algorithms is the variational quantum maker solver or QAA, quantum approximate optimization algorithm. Yeah. So those are, let's say, the NISC algorithms that we are using nowadays. Now, that's at the top of the stack. At the bottom of the stack, we have different technologies that are being used for implementing the qubits. I already mentioned some of them before, so such as trapped ions, quantum dots, photons, and B centers, superconducting qubits. The most advanced ones, and I say this with quotation mark, the most advanced, because they are the ones that have the highest number of qubits, are trapped ions and superconducting qubits. Yeah, but all of them, they have similar problems, that the problem is to enhance the coherence of the qubits, so how long the qubits uh, live, to enhance the operation fidelity, so to low this error rate that I was mentioning before, and the scalability, how to scale up these quantum processes and put more and more qubits there. Hmm? Now, what's in between? So as I said, at the top of the stack, we have the algorithms. At the bottom, the devices. What's in between? What do we need? So as I mentioned before, we need classical control electronics for controlling or for operating the qubits and reading out the information. For that, usually these control electronics are placed at room temperature. However, this approach is not scalable because you have plenty of cables going from room temperature to 20 millikelvins, and you don't have enough uh, cooling power budget for that. So one of the solutions that people are looking at, people in the, in the electronic, electronic field, is to move some of these control electronics close to your quantum chip. And some colleagues have dealt, what I really developed is this whole reach that was presented, I think, like 2021, so last year. And they put here some DACs and some RF generators for reading out the qubits operating at, four, at 4K, yeah? So we cannot go maybe to 20 millik, but we can go to 4K. And there are also demonstrations for some qubit technologies like silicon spin qubits that they can also operate at the Kelvin, at the 4K uh, range, right? So at some point, Ideally, we like, they would like to integrate both integration of the electronics together with the qubits on the same, the same plane. So what does we have in between? So what's next? I'm, I'm, I didn't say that, but I'm going like, like uh, bottom up in the, in the stack. Now, what we have uh, uh, after the control electronics, we have this charge set architecture and the macro architecture. As you may know, so this, uh, so the macro architecture is just the implementation of disruptions that are executable, let's say, for your chip. And this is just an schematic of an AMIC architecture that we developed like already five years ago, yeah, 2017. And for that, we won the best paper award at microconference. And at the end, so what, it, what basically it does is to take these low level instructions written in Quasum or kind of language, right, binaries, and translate into a series of, 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 of uh, code words and signals at the end that are sent and operate, uh, and operate the chip. So this is, as I say, just the schematic, it's just a drawing, but it materializes in this, in this what we call the CC light, the control uh, light box. This was for, if I'm not mistaken, for controlling seven superconducting qubits, and there was another version, the, the QT controller for 17 superconducting qubits. And if you look here, just a bunch on FPGA, I mean, not just, there's more there, right? But there are three, four FPGAs working together, right? For generating the signals. Anyway, and this is part of the, of, the, of the stack that I was showing you for, right? This is one. At the end, what it does basically is to orchestrate the devices. It says, you, AWG1, send this signal to this qubit at this time. Now, you basically is that the orchestrator of the, of the other devices. Now, on top of that, on top of that, we have going to the higher levels of the stack, we have what we call the quantum programming frameworks. There are several quantum programming frameworks that are being used nowadays, being one of the most uh, popular ones, the QuizKit from IBM, right? What they provide is high-level programming languages for expressing your algorithms, for writing your algorithms, as well as, co as compiler, not only to translate, let's say, that high-level language into, into, into a language that is executable on your device, but also to perform or to do several processes, let's say, or several modifications to your quantum circuit, yeah? Here, you see something that is called the composer, place, route, scheduler. I will come into that later. So basically what it means is that we have the chips that we have nowadays, they have several constraints that we have to consider if we want to successfully run an algorithm on that. And that's what we call 
the mapping of quantum circuits. And that's one of the, let's say, of the focus, of, one of the focuses of the focus of, of my research. So let me, let me explain a little bit more what this mapping is about. So we can define the mapping as the process to transform the circuits in a way that they satisfy the quantum processor constraints. One of the most constraints or the, 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 most, the, the, the most critical constraint that we have to deal nowadays is the limited connectivity of the qubits in the chip. Imagine, so here, imagine that I want to run this circuit. This pointer, I don't know. No, it's not working. Anyway, so this is a circuit with seven qubits with some single qubit gates and two qubit gates, those are C-nodes. And this is just a picture, let's say, of the layout of a quantum chip. Imagine that each of the, uh, of the black dots, it's a qubit in your chip, and each of the edges is a connection and therefore a possible interactions between them. In another way, I don't know if this is long enough, Yes, it is, good. In, I don't know if you can see here. So that means that this qubit, for instance, can interact with this other qubit. It can perform a C-naught, but these two qubits cannot interact. They cannot perform a C-naught. That's basically the idea, yeah? Okay, then I come back. So again, imagine that I want to run this quantum circuit on this device. So what the compiler should do, among other things, I'm going to explain just the main steps, right? So the first thing is like, you don't want to, to, let's say, to apply the operations one after the other, right? You want to schedule the operations to leverage the parallelism of them. In other ways, there are some operations that can be applied in parallel, right? And this is similar to classical computer. But here, it's even more criti critical because you have to deal with the short, uh, with the short uh, coherence time of the qubits, right? So you have to make sure that all these operations are applied before your qubit dies, basically, yeah? Now, what else? I have here a circuit with seven qubits. In, in on the top, so where those qubits are placed or initialized in your physical device. You can do it randomly, but because we have this, this connectivity limitation, you can do it better, and you can optimize that in a way that the qubits that uh, highly interact, right, that perform a C not, they are already placed from the beginning next to each other, yeah? That for instance, imagine that I want to, to run this circuit, and then I initialize the qubit in this way. So if you look at the first slice, let's say, and there is a signal between three and four. Three and four, if you look below, they are next to each other. So they can do, they can perform the C note and so on with the, and the same for the next stages. But what happens here, like I have a C note for zero and five and two and three. And if you look at the three, at the third picture, sorry, yeah, two and three are not next to each other, neither for a zero and five, yeah? So what do we do to deal with that? What can we solve the problem? So what we do is to introduce some extra operations that are called swap, but again, the swap operation, they exchange the state between, between two qubits to bring those, those qubit or quantum state, the qubit state there doesn't move, those quantum states together and be able to perform the synod. That means that you increase the number of operations in your circuits. And again, that's critical because you have short coherence time and that's critical because any operation increases the probability of having an error in your system, yeah? So, what other constraints we have to deal with? As I say, one of the most critical ones is the limited connectivity, but there are others. Like for example, all chips that have like I say a primitive or elementary gate set. That means that those are the gates that are supported or implementable in your quantum chip. Just to give an example, some of these chips they only they, they, you can only with some of these chips you can only perform single qubit rotation or what we call C-phase gate, not the C-node that can be decomposed. So anyway, so the point here is like the gates in your circuit have to be decomposed and that's also an increase of the gates to the gates that are supported by your device. Yeah, that's the main idea. Then the limited connectivity that I mentioned before, but you have all, can make much also have limitations in terms of classical control. So as I said before, you can, I mean, ideally you would like to have one HWG for controlling each of the qubits, right? But that's not scalable, and on top of that, super, super expensive. So in order to scale the systems, what you use is shared control electronics, and that pose some limitations in the parallelization capabilities of your device. Hmm? And other, other, other things that we have to deal with is, for example, crosstalk. Crosstalk uh, is just unwanted interactions between different pairs of qubits whenever you are performing a two-qubit gate. Yeah? So just to, to show a bit more. So I think that is clear from the example that I show, uh, I, I saw uh, shown before, sorry, that the compilation results in an increase of the number of operations, because in this case, I'm adding those swaps, yeah? An increase of the circuit depth. The circuit depth is the number of stages or slices in your circuit, and also therefore in an increase of the execution time. Therefore, what it happens is like, 
because of this increase, what it results is in a decrease of the algorithm fidelity or the success rate of the algorithm. Here in this picture, you can see how the circuit fidelity decreases uh, with the number of, of gates or what is the fidelity decrease after the gate overhead that is that is uh, that results from the mapping process. So what's the important message here? So the important thing to mention here is that these compilation techniques have to be very efficient and very optimal to make sure that your algorithm can be successfully run in your device. So you have to transform the circuit to make it runnable in your device, but be careful there because you are incurring in an overhead. Hmm? Say that. What is different also in these full stacks, which is basically different from, let's say, from, from classical computers? So the main difference is nowadays we have to deal with diversity. As I mentioned before, and this diversity is very clear at the physical level in which there are different technologies competing, right? We don't know which one will outperform the others, but now there are different technologies that are being explored. And of course, we have to, to deal, what I said before, with the impairments and the constraints of the technology, right? So this diversity is also at the software level in which different solutions uh, coexist for mainly for three reasons, because the high in the, in the, in the stack, the more, let's say, uh, uh, Quantum, uh, quantum framework solutions can coexist. Also, because this is a very emerging, uh, an emerging field and we are still in the process of, of exploring different solutions. And the most important thing is even though they follow, let's say, the same, the same process of mapping, uh, play, uh, scheduling, initial placement, and so on and so forth, they, they are looking at different techniques for dealing for these short coherence time, higher rates, and so of course, devices that we have in the physical device. So in other words, what we are developing is what we call hardware aware software techniques. Hmm? Now, coming back to the, to the full stack. So we have, just to <laughs> make sure that we are now right, I will you through the, through the different layers. Now I'm going to, to emphasize what the challenges that we have nowadays. So this is the full stack that I showed before, and this is what we aim to. What we aim to have is this full stack with, in which, uh, but it's very similar to the, to the classical uh, computers in which abstractions has been introduced in the form of well-defined and encapsulated, uh, well-defined and self-contained layers that encapsulate a specific information and it's only shared between adjacent layers, right? This level of abstraction, so it, is, it has to be impossible to, to, let's say, to increase the level of abstraction in classical systems because the number of the resources has been increasing year by year, right? But this is not the case for quantum computer, at least nowadays, right? As I mentioned before, we have devices that are very limited in the number of qubits and that are error prone, right? So what we have nowadays is more something like that, in which there is a tight interplay among, across functionalities of the different functional elements that, again, they are, they are really there. And there is no, let's say, clear allocation on functionality per layer. As the quantum system evolves, the functionality is moving from one, let's say, functional unit to the other. I remember at the beginning when I was starting working with the physicists, is any problem they had, it was maybe low level problems, put it in the compiler, put it in the compiler, right? Okay, we cannot solve everything, right? So what functionality is located, let's say, at runtime in the microarchitecture, what we can do in the higher levels? We don't know yet, so it's still, we are not even, I mean, we are following the structure that or architecture that we follow in, in classical computers, right? Is that the way to go? Is the best we know nowadays, right? And the best we did in the past. So maybe we are completely wrong. We'll see in the next years. Anyway, and the other thing is, as I said before, so the high levels of the stack have to be exposed to the low level information to deal, to deal with, the, with the impairments. So allowing this information flowing from the physical lowest level to the higher level of the, of the stack is not only a must for being able to successfully run the algorithm, but also the best way to maximize performance of the devices that we have nowadays. Yeah? Let me just breathe and take a little water. So, we like to postulate, and this is a work that I did together with my colleague here, Professor Alarcon, that we like to postulate that we are not only in the NISC era, we are also in the quantum architecting era. Although these layers have been there for a while, this is not, not, this is not new. I mean, we have been working 
in, in this in the last 10 to 15 years, right? Uh, in this quantum architecture era, we add these extra layers, not to only to complete the system, but also to deal with the environment that I mentioned before, and also to allow the development of applications and application-specific architectures, at least in the, in the next years, right? So what is crucial? What are the key attributes of this, of this architecture era for architecting a quantum computing uh, system? I would like to emphasize three, at least. I think that those are the most important ones. is co-design, it's optimization, and it's benchmarking. And let me, let me explain a bit more about these three concepts. So what is co-design? I took this sentence from a paper from, from Martin Ossi from Princeton University, which I think is very good. So they define in the paper co-design as a flow of information between different hardware and software stack layers in order to improve the overall application execution and hardware design. And in terms of quantum co-design, it's about incorporating this information into the techniques and system designs at every layer of the stack to make use, to make optimal use of the limited resources, something in the lines that I mentioned before, right? So here in this paper, they also provide some examples of co-design in, in the uh, quantum computing full stacks. The first one is quantum hardware design based on quantum applications. And the most clear example of that is that, for example, nowadays there are chips in which the layout is defi defined by the quantum error correction code that you want to implement, being one of the most popular ones, the surface code, that is just, it just requires a 2D array of qubits, like the one that I mentioned before, yeah? The other example of quantum co-design is quantum algorithm design based on quantum hardware, NISC algorithms. What we have nowadays, NISC processors, right? So let's try to develop some applications and come with algorithms that can be uh, successfully run on those devices, yeah? And I think for me, the most clear example also of co-design is the compiler, the one that I mentioned before, right? Quantum compilers, they sit in between these layers between the application of the algorithm and the hardware there, right? And as I mentioned before, they have to deal with the limitations with the quantum hardware and accommodate the requirements algorithms. But I will go one step, one step further there. Before, I say that these quantum compilers, they have to be exposed to the low level details of the quantum, of the quantum hardware. Okay, so we did the following. What we did is to run different algorithms using uh, the QMA mapper that is in OpenQL, a compiler for, that we developed in, 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 in QDEL. And we, we obtained some metrics that, such as the gauge overhead, the latency overhead, and the decrease of fidelity. And we did that for different kinds of algorithms. Algorithms or circuits that were randomly generated using different techniques, like the one there's a benchmark set that is called Keiko or another that we, I mean, that we uh, generated using a uniform distribution. And we did that also, those are the ones in green and, and red. And also we use some libraries with real quantum algorithms, yeah? And you can observe here that they show a different behavior. And why is that? This is not only, and they have more or less the same, the same range in terms of qubits, of gates, and percentage of two qubit gates, which is one of the important parameters here. Why is that? So we look, into that, and we also realize that it's very important then to profile and to look into the algorithms. Why is that? Because these techniques should not be only, let's say, hardware aware, they should be also algorithm driven. So here is an example of what we call qubit interaction graph. The qubit interaction graph, this is a representation in the, of the circuit in which each of the, uh, of the dots, it's all the node is a qubit, so six qubits, and each of the edges represent the interactions between them. So these two circuits, a QOA and, ran, and a randomly generated circuit, in principle, when they look at, at, at them, they look similar. They both have six qubits. They don't have, I don't remember how many, but the same number of gates. And they have the same percentage, percentage sorry, of two qubit gates. The two qubit gates are the edges with the weights. But if you look at the interaction graph, it's completely different. How the interactions are distributed among qubits, and, and this is more connected, let's say, that, that the one on the left, and also the weights, how many times each, qubit, each pair of qubits interact. Right. So what we are doing now, together with our colleagues at Delft, is indeed to look into this interaction graph and uh, have some graph-based metrics to profile and to further characterize the algorithms. Yeah. This will allow, as I say, to develop algorithm-driven and hardware aware techniques, but also to develop uh, to develop uh, better, to, uh, not only to develop better mapping techniques, but also to come up with a taxonomy of algorithms and to classify them. Right? So they can come from different families, but at the end, if they have these characteristics, you expect them to behave in the same way whenever you run them in your device. Hmm? 
say this. First thing, as I say, co-design. Second thing, optimization. Optimization is also crucial in this, in this year and will be in the next years, right? Optimization is crucial to come up with a comparison with the different approaches. As I said, we have different technologies competing and different full stacks being developed. They can, there might be some difference between them. So it's again, crucial for that. It's crucial, as I mentioned before, to strike the potential, to strike, sorry, the potential of current and near-term devices and to deal with the, with the impairments. I will not say that it's crucial, I would say it's a must. There is no other way to do that. And it's crucial also if we want to develop what we call application specific coprocessors, that I think is what we will see in the next coming years. So what we postulate is that in order to, to, to optimize quantum systems, we can use a structured, what we call the structured design space exploration uh, uh, techniques. I will not explain in detail this, but what basically, uh, what you basically need to do if you want to pose this, this, kind, this uh, problem as an optimization problem, you need to define some input variables that define your design space. You have to def uh, also define these performance metrics to uh, define, let's say, the output performance space, and also to relate these performance metrics to the to the input variables in a form of a multidimensional function that can be that can be derived from experimental data or from analytical models. Yeah. Then finally, we also need to define a few of mate that it's an aggregated, let's say, that aggregates all these functions in a single number, right? And, and allows you to to pose this as, a, as a just single number, single number optimization optimization problem. Now, third important thing for, for, for architecting quantum computers. The third important thing uh, is the benchmark or benchmarking of quantum computers. There has been an effort in the community to define some metrics that can be used to evaluate the quality of your computer or the performance of your computer. IBM uh, defined these three metrics that are related to scale, quality, and speed. A scale is just the number of qubits. I know how important that is because indeed if you have 1,000 qubits but they don't work very well, so what you can do, right? But again, it's important to get more and more qubits. The quality is measured to something called quantum volume. Quantum volume is a single number metric, but it has into account not only the technological parameters, but also other parameters of the full stack. So for instance, how good you are when you compile your, your algorithm, you optimize the algorithm. And our metric that was recently proposed is the speed that is measured by CLOPS, that stands for circuit layer operations per second, that indicates how many circuits can be run on a hardware in a given time. And this is very important because nowadays we have, they are putting in, the, in the, this in cloud system more runtime support, right? And this is in, in, in that regard. And also for the variation, of course, algorithms, right? So, but again, benchmarking is not only about defining uh, metrics, it's also about defining a, a, a complete set of benchmarks of algorithms that you can use, not only to develop your system or to develop this full stack, but also to compare your, your systems. So this is a paper also from Martelos's group that was recently published, and I'll, I think uh, I like it very much. And what they say here, like, they are already a set of, set of benchmarks that have been proposed, but they are not complete because they are just focused on a single application or because they are not scalable or because they are only used for characterize, let's say, the low level, the, 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 physical, uh, the physical technology parameters, right? Like such as noise. But what are the properties that a scalable quantum benchmark uh, suite should have? So they mention scalability. Scalability in the sense like the algorithm is scalable and you can go to higher number of qubits, but also in the way that you verify that is working properly because usually what we do nowadays is that you run your algorithm in the, in the quantum computer, you run it in a simulator without noise, with noise, and then you compare, yeah? But as you, as you know, and this is something that I think they are also working here in, 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 at VSC, is like the simulators are limited by the number of qubits that they can simulate. In a classical super, in a classical computer or supercomputer, right? So it's not that we can simulate 1,000 qubits. Hmm? Now, the other properties that they are meaningful and diverse that they cover the full, the, let's say, the the all the scenarios, and they are meaningful that they are representative of the real world logs that we will have with real algorithms, that they are full, that they allow the evaluation of the full system, not only the microarchitecture of the device, but all the layers that I was mentioning before, and that they are editable. 
what that means, the quantum computers are evolving, are progressing above, right? So we have to be able to adapt our benchmarks to the new requirements of the of the of the of the uh, computers, so the technologies to come. Now, how does the future look like? Okay, so far I've been talking about about NISC, uh, quantum computers, but what do we expect to have in the next in the next year, right? This is the roadmap that IBM published back in 2019. And you can see one of the main, the main issues that I mentioned before, it is scalability. They want, of course, to increase the number of qubits to being able to have the full potential of, of quantum computers, right? And what you can see here is that we are right now here with 433 qubits and that yes to increase the number of qubits. And of course, as you increase the number of qubits, you increase the functionality of the, of the layers on top of that, right? You need more runtime, you need HPC, you need uh, more libraries, you name it. Again, this was published in 2019 and in May, 2022, so past May, they published an update of this roadmap. And what is the main difference? The main difference is not in the, the functionality of the, of the other layers that also, but if you look here, they propose to go to from what we call like a single chip architecture to a multi-core architecture with different chips and connected and combined. So inspired by classical computer, right? We follow the same path. Now, let me let me explain a bit more about, about this picture. So the first thing that they propose is to have this Heron system with 133 qubits and connect the three of them using only classical communication. Okay, that means that we will not be able to perform, let's say, a kind of distributed quantum computing, but we will need to use some tricks that are called circuit cutting and knitting. I'm not going to go into that, but what it means basically is that you have your quantum algorithm, you partition in the number of qubits, and then you have to play some tricks in pre-processing and post-processing to rebuild the, this output distribution that I was mentioning before. And this is a huge overhead, we are not sure that will pay off and that will work or not, yeah? First thing. Second thing that they propose, to take some of them and just to com communicate them via two qubit gates in the chip, right? And for that, they propose this Flamingo with two chips with 400, uh, three chips, sorry, of 400, uh, 462 qubits. And the big picture by 2025, this have to, they expect to have this 4,000 plus qubits in which these different processors, multi-chip processor, I com are combined via quantum links, quantum communication channels. Yeah, there are already people working on these quantum communication channels. So the goal of IBM is to build what they call a quantum centric supercomputers. Now we have AI centric supercomputers, so following the same models. It will, the supercomputer will incorporate quantum processors, classical processors, classical communications, and quantum communications. Here we go. You can see the complexity of this, right? So not trivial. So again, this was published by, by IBM uh, this year, my this year, but I have to say that back in 2019, we came out with a similar idea also with our colleagues here at UPC. This is again, the work in collaboration with uh, Alar, uh, Professor Alarcón Abadal and Santi, who is sitting, he's not here. Okay, okay, he's on his phone. Anyway, so a PhD student in, in his group in which the novelty here is not about architecture itself because this thing of using a model architecture was proposed other, by other groups, mostly by physicists. But the novelty here is how to incorporate these classical communications together with the computing stack and the, and the quantum communication, yeah? So in order to do, th to do that, what we propose is to, to have what we call a double full stack in which the computing stack that I was showing before is intertwined with the layers of the communication stack for classical communication and for quantum communication. And again, this is not trivial, yeah? So what we also did, and this is mostly again, the work of, 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 uh, of Santi, is to see if indeed these systems will pay off. In other words, if going for a multi-core architecture will pay off or there will be, or it will not because of the communication will kill the computation, yeah? So in order to do so, we started running some experiments using this design exploration methodology that I was mentioning before, in which we input some parameters from the application, from the communications and from the architecture itself, like for example, the number of cores and the number of qubits 
per core in each of them, and we map them in this multi-core architecture, again, using this uh, design exploration, uh, structural design exploration technique. We have already we published some results in which this is just uh, the, the some matches like horizon side, the communication overhead, and a few of many that we define. I will not enter into the details. You have the, the paper here if you would like to know more about this. But what is interesting is the, the, the bottom right graph in which you see that there is a decrease of performance whenever you go from one to two cores. But once you go to 16 cores, that performance is similar to the single core case. Here we didn't we didn't let's say model the impairments of the device the noise that has to be incorporated. It was just the first exploration of of the of these kind of, of architectures. This is for randomly generated algorithms for circuits, and we run the same experiments for these randomly generated algorithms, but also for other like kind of routines like the QFT of the Grovers. And what we can observe here is that the Grovers, the sorry, the QFT, the green line. Whenever you go to more than, I think it's four cores, it already outperforms the single core system. And that's because these kind of algorithms have are more structured like that the random algorithm. So exploiting this structure, you can really take advantage of this multi-core architecture. Yeah, but again, this is just some first results. I mean, there will be other people working on that. So we expect, we expect to have more insights into, into, you know, into, the, into this multi-core architecture. Um, what are the challenges then for this new multi-core approach? The challenges are several. So first, the development of this double full stack that I was mentioning before. Then that now in your quantum processor, you need qubits devoted to computation and qubits devoted to communication. So you will need to have communication ports for that. Of course, the development, which is far from trivial of quantum coherent communication links for transmitting quantum information across chips, yeah? The communication protocols, classical communication protocols, and quantum communication protocols that we will need for that. The compilers that I was mentioning before, before the compilers for single core, now it's from single core and from multi core, right? You need like, like two stage, let's say, compilation, uh, compilation phases. And again, to define benchmarks and metrics that uh, include communications. Yeah. So we are still in the face of that, of doing that, let's say, the benchmarking, the benchmarking for single core computers. Now, the same problems for, for multi-core computers. Now, luckily, as I said, we had this idea back in 2019, and we would, of course, we thought, okay, we should write a proposal, right, and, and get a project. So it turns out that we were lucky to get an EIC Pythander project, which I'm the coordinator in, in this, this year, in 2022, to be started in next year. We hope so, right? So, and it's that's exactly the vision that I was mentioning here. It's composed in this, in this uh, project, the European project. We have nine partners working from the technology, the quantum coherent links, working on the classical communication links here at UPC, working on the applications, PSC, on the compilers, myself. So it's just to put all this picture together. There will be, as I say, a project that will start uh, next year and will last for four for years, and which I have the privilege to, to coordinate. Now, finally, I would like to thank all this work that I present here is not, of course, only my work. It's done in collaboration and thanks to the discussions with different people. So I would like to thank the team here at Technical University of Catalonia. I expect to put more people in this, in this picture, Sahar, Pau, that they will start working on these topics too. People from Technical University of Dell, my previous scholars in QTEC, and people, of course, from my university in Valencia. So with that, Thank you for listening, for your attention. And if you have any questions, please go ahead. Thank you, Carmen. And uh, it was a great talk. It, it, to me, it was more a masterclass, to be honest. Mm -hmm. You discover everything. <laughs> so uh, yeah, yeah, it was really clarifying. So is there any questions? Thank you. Thank you for the talk. For me, uh, um, working on the very upper layer of this full stack, it was nice to see the straightforward between the quantum hardware and the algorithm uh, device. And I was interested if, if you could tell more about compilers or um, probably it would be one of these pieces you mentioned, you just put it in the compiler. So I'm interested, <laughs> um, for example, what, what can do uh, now compilers is say I don't care about how everything is connected in the hardware. Can I tell the compiler um, 
efficiently uh, compile this for uh, Sycamore connectivity, something like this. Yeah, that's actually basically what we do. So what do you, I mean, just to give you more details, what we have is the compiler, there's what we call a configuration file, JSON file, in which you describe your hardware. That description might include, of course, interconnectivity between the qubits to see what, what uh, interactions are allowed, right? It can describe the cooking stance of the qubits because you can inc include also error information there. Why is that? Because if I have a, a, a system with 10 qubits, but I'm only going to use five, I'm going to use the most reliable ones. As you know, for example, IBM, if you look at the at the layout, they have different error rates between person qubits and also different coherence time, right? For instance, you can include information, of course, about the duration of the gates for scheduling, for fine grain scheduling, yeah? And basically what you do is this mapping, but what else they can do? As I said, they also do the decomposition of the gates, which is far from trivial, and depending on the technique that you use, you can get that with lower overheads. They can also optimize your circuit in terms of C0 gates, in terms of T gates, whenever we go to, to filter and regime, right? That T gates are very expensive. In terms, if imagine, I'm going to put a string here, right? Imagine that, that, that your qubits, your error rates are good, but, but your coherence, your coherence time is very, is very short then what you want to reduce is the circuit depth, right? Or the other way around. Maybe your coherence, I don't know what they say anymore, but your coherence time is very long, but your rates are, are, are uh, very high. So you want to, to, to reduce the number of gates, which is kind of related, but not always, right? So you can play some tricks. Also, you can play with commutation rules to come up with different schedules, because as you know, in quantum computing, there are some gates that they commute with each other. So depending how you reorder the gates, you can come up with a better implementation for your device. So those are, let's say, nowadays capabilities of the. Can you provide some CASM uh, algorithm that language? Or, so what do we provide the compiler? The algorithm itself? Yeah. Okay, that's yeah, at the end. Like there is an intermediate representation that we use what we call intermediate representation, IRs, right? That is just a description, basically, of the circuit in different, in different ways, right? And what you provide is the input algorithm and the characteristics of the device. So there are two inputs. And the output, the output, it's a kind of, 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 of file written in Quasum, Quasum language, that is just the, the original instructions or kind of with some modifications there, the ones for the routing or for optimizing or, yeah. Sure. For example, I mean, imagine that there's, there's a, let's say, someone who doesn't know about quantum, right? And it's just like that, it does like S gate, S gate, S gate, so they cancel each other, right? The compiler will do that for that. At the end, it will say identity, nothing. Very simple example. Yeah? The compiler will do that for you, but not everything. <laughs> and not everything for the physical devices. <laughs> Don't put everything there, right? But now, I mean, as I mentioned before, something very important is as the system evolves, we are adding new extra functionalities. Another example now with these variational algorithms, what happens there? That you need this feedback loop, and you need this feedback loop to be very close to your device. You don't want to go to the compiler back and forth, right? That means that you have to add runtime capabilities. Usually that's it's, it's, it's the, the Mac architecture. Yeah, this control box that I was showing before. Another example, uh, what I was about to say about this, this, ah, another example, you need parameterized, parameterized gate. Yeah, put it in the compiler, give you a parameter. Say, okay, what's the capability? What's the memory that you have for doing so? How you are going to provide that thing? I mean, creating an instruction for that, fine. But then how do you implement that? Yeah. So, and again, we are adding more and more functionalities and extra instruction and extra things as the systems evolve, not only in the recruitment, but also the, the, the demands from, from the algorithm side. And we are trying to bridge that gap, which is not always easy, so. Yes, please go ahead. So um, here in quantum computing world, I see like uh, compilers are more like an optimization pipeline, mm -hmm. more than it's very different from where compilers get from in the classical uh, world, that they were more like a, a translator from uh, a more natural language to the uh, to assembly. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is, are there some advances and what are the problems for getting um, higher level quantum uh, language? Because I know- Good question. <laughs> With question. We are not sure about that. Like, it's, it's good to get abstracted. I don't know. It's okay, very good question. This is I was attending the IEEE Quantum Week. I don't know you have been there, so it's a very good conference, especially for engineers. <clears throat> Sorry for that. There was a panel discussion on that. 
on engineering languages and on programming languages and so on. When I say high level programming language, I mean, we say high level programming language. I mean, not really, right? <laughs> I'm just like, <laughs> typing, let's say, my circuit in Python, Hadam or whatever, and then, you know, the same, but for assembly. So the distinction between them is, is minimal, right? So uh, the point is like, we don't know what will be the, the let's put it in that way, the best programming model. While we are using the circuit model computation, I think in my opinion is because it's very similar to what we do in, in, in classical, right? We have circuits, we have circuits here. Is the most efficient, efficient one having quantum computing devices? Not sure. Is better quantum annealing because yeah, you have these Hamiltonians and these things that there's like, it's more one-to-one -one with the devices, might be. So the one who comes with a very good, let's say, programming model and with this, this real, to, uh, real this, this high level abstraction, wow. But the community, there are people working on that and there is a debate on that, of course, but at least we don't know. And I have no idea to be honest. So. Yes. The connectivity of the device, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, the device level. That depends on the technology. But I will mention that. So in superconducting qubits, I will talk about the two technologies that I was mostly working on. Sorry, it got stuck here. <laughs> but, okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. No worries. No worries. No, it's funny. Exactly. I'm stuck with the computer. Anyway. So that depends on the technology. So I'm going to comment on the, the two ones that I'm more familiar with, that those are the ones that I was working on when I was in QDAL. That is the superconducting qubits and the silicon spin qubits. In the superconducting qubits, this connectivity, those are resonators between the qubits. So that's what gives you what qubits can interact. And what you do basically is whenever you want to perform a, a two qubit gate and you have the resonator, is that they operate at different frequencies and then you bring those frequencies together, they interact for a while and then you separate those frequencies again. Yeah, that's basically how it works. In other technologies such as silicon spin qubits, and I don't know if you might heard about this one. This is the one that, that Intel is looking at. Of course, they are like silicon manufacturers, right? So the best company for doing that is, is, is uh, these are just, just transistors. They're very, very small, and then you trap an electron there. Or, yeah. And how it works there is like you have a kind of barrier between them. And by applying some DC signals and some electromagnetic fields, you lower that barrier, then the qubits, the electrons can interact. And whenever they interact, then you put that barrier again, more or less. I cannot give you more details because this is how far I know. I mean, like, I know. Mm -hmm. Exactly. No, no, no. It can be, it can be long length, long range. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Ultra connection. Yeah, for example, in ion traps, you have that. With the number of qubits that we have now, they, they have nowadays, they have all 12 connection. What that means, indeed, that if you have all 12 connections, you don't have to worry about the connectivity. I mean, any, any, any interaction is possible in your device. So you will not have to add these extra traps or extra gates that I was mentioning before, right? But I don't know the details exactly, but the point is like, so there is a trade-off also. I mean, there are technical, technical issues there that, uh, to be honest, I don't know the details, but there are other issues that there's a trade-off between the connectivity, for instance, and the crosstalk. So the more connected the qubits are, better for the application, but the more crosstalk you will have in your system and the higher the error rate. That's why also, if you look at the, and I think I show some of the, of the layouts of the IBM chips, but they are following what they call hexagonal, uh, hexagonal uh, layout. They have this kind of a squares because it seems that this kind of connectivity works pretty well, let's say, in the amount of connections that you have at the noise that you have in your device. Yeah, so it's not only a physical limitation, it's also because the problems that you have once you, let's say, uh, interconnect all qubits. Hmm? Yes. Yeah. 
creates or um, and a reconfigurable chip. Yes. Reconfigurability chip. Quantum FPGA. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wish <laughs> that will exist. This, that not exists right now. I mean, that would be possible, but for example, there, there is uh, one chip that is the Sycamore chip in which, let's say, but not the, the links between the qubits or the connections, they are reconfigurable. But they are not reconfigurable that you can connect to other, let's say, qubit. It's like they are on and off to avoid, for example, these cross talk side effects. Yeah. But what, what we are also looking at, and that's something that we are also looking at together with colleagues here at UPC, is, uh, is that Okay, so so far it's like I have this chip and I have an algorithm. So the chip is the one, let's say, dominating. So then you implement the algorithm here. Why not the other way around? This is what we call this application specific, no? I have this algorithm. What will be a feasible and still good performance layout or chip design that in which this, I will not say algorithm, I will say this kind of specific applications or group of algorithms, because if we profile them, we characterize them and then we uh, categorize them, right? Was, Pretty well. You can do it so the other way around. Design chips based on the application or what is happening, what I said before for quantum error correction codes. Yeah. Actually, yeah. maybe last question. So, regarding the, the last thing you said, so there is this kind of two strategies of designing the chip uh, according to the application or finding the application according to the chip. <laughs> yeah. So, this is more a, an opinion. So, what do you think? It's the Best strategy at short term, both of them, or maybe at the short term, one of those has more more sense than the other. Or what is your take on that? Not just a question to answer. Thank you. <laughs> those are the ones that you have to really think. Okay, let me see. I think that you can be not. I mean, they have to be both. You have to explore both in parallel, right? I mean, because but in the short term, we will go for this application specific, which not everyone shares that 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 opinion. I think the way the way to go is to to consider what kind of applications you will be to run in the next years and then to develop something that can can implement that, right? But again, but again I think maybe it's not the other way or the other. Thinking a bit more, it's about, it's, as I say, co-design and looking at the trade-off and the performances and the cross-layer vertical co-design, right? So, yeah. Makes sense. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, Thanks to you. It was a very nice talk. Nice. Yeah. My pleasure.